My name is Matt Trout. We're here at uh, Concilium 2015 in conversation with Ravi Sajwan and Leroy Hood. So gentlemen, welcome to Concilium 2015. Um, so as part of the session we'll be running tomorrow on uh, aging and the new science of wellness, we thought we'd film this and, and get some more of your views. Um, so uh, let me start with an easy question, right? So there's this issue of the aging dynamic. The first world is, is getting older and there are a lot, lot more old people and this could cripple the health system. It, it, costs are escalating. And this is happening at a time when we're, we're experiencing, you know, some call it a revolution in science. I like the word inflection point, where we're seeing this massive conversion of, uh, or convergence of biology, engineering, information technology like we've never seen it before, right? So I want to get your views on how that could impact this problem of, uh, of demographics, aging, and wellness. Lee, would you like to start? Sure. As we uh, all know, uh, wellness is a key and vital part of your health, as is disease. But the current healthcare system focuses 99% of its resources on disease and almost nothing on wellness. And it's my contention that if we begin to emphasize wellness, as we now know we can do, we can absolutely transform society in the sense we can keep you well, mentally alert, physically capable for perhaps up to 100 years or so and change the dynamic and structure of society in major ways. And, and one point I'll make is this convergence that's happening is not just in the sciences. Because one of the big questions this would raise is, if we can keep you healthy and capable and functional until you're 100, what happens to the retirement system? What, how can you create productive work? And how can society at the same time create jobs for young people? So we have to bring in uh, sociology. We have to bring in philosophy. We have to bring in, I mean, the convergence that's going to happen is going to be many of the life disciplines, including the sciences, the humanities, and ultimately the social sciences. Do you want to comment just on some of the technologies that you see, before we go to Ravi, sure. some of the technologies that you see as being incredibly disruptive here? Sequencing, other tech, what do you see, Lee, in the next three to five years as being incredibly disruptive technologies in this space? Well, let me tell you how we measure scientific wellness. We take an individual and we essentially do a 360 degree scan of that individual, looking at their complete genome sequence and getting blood and urine and saliva and looking at clinical chemistries and metabolites and proteins and even getting a bit of stool so we can look at the gut metabolome. And that together with quantized self measurements with a Fitbit allows you to us assess activity and quality of sleep, those all can be integrated to, for each individual, identify actionable possibilities that let us optimize wellness and let us minimize disease. Do you, do you see us catching the diseases before they occur and reversing them? So you, you can do two things with wellness that are really important. One, you can optimize the potential of each individual right up to the maximum, so you can be the best you can be. But number two, if you study wellness, you will naturally see transitions into disease. And if we can cast the transitions at their very earliest point and figure out how to reverse illness back to wellness, then we can save the healthcare system all of that downstream disease that the person would ordinarily go through. And the most important point is if we catch it at the very beginning, it's reversible. Often, when the doctor waits until you're sick, it isn't completely reversible. Now, you asked me about technology. So I think the technologies for genome sequencing are going to be revolutionary. I see new nanotechnologies for sequencing in a 10 to 15 year period easily giving us a hundred dollar genome sequence. I see new nanotechnology approaches to doing 
clinical chemistries and metabolites and proteins that are going to be revolutionary and will put the cost of those assays on a Moore's Law decline and bring the cost of the 360 degree survey from perhaps 5,000, which it costs now, uh, I would project in a five year period down to perhaps 500. So there are revolutionary changes that are going to come with technology allowing us to make these measurements more accurately on far less sample more quickly. And in fact, in the future, maybe virtually all the measurements will be made at home. And probably for free, so or close to free. Let me bring Ravi in. So Ravi, your perspectives on, on this area. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so Lee, thanks for the descriptive because what Lee said is very important. Wellness for a long time has had a very dubious distinction because there's no way to really quantify it. So what Lee has put together is an amazing quantification scheme and it requires two to three things. It requires the individual on whom you're gonna perform this measurement. It requires a bunch of sensors to perform the measurement. And most importantly, it requires a lot of computational analysis, which will come up and say, what is the real index? So our focus as a company has been to focus on, number one, the sensors. How do you come up with sensors that are disposable, low cost, but most importantly, non-invasive and are customer administered? So I don't have to call a patient to my clinic. They can stay home, stick a sensor, all the data gets recorded over the cloud in the network, and all the predictive algorithms kick in to come up with a way to define wellness. When you give clinical accurate data as an input, you typically get much better interpretive decisions. So that's what we are focused on, and one of the things I wanted to point out was um, why I'm here actually. So Matt and I met in New York, and uh, some of the things he's done are fascinating. So we are very closely monitoring the work AIBN is doing and trying to figure out if we can actually partner together in building a new set of technologies. Yeah. So, but, um, so going back to my grandmother, who used to always make the same comment that, you know, age is a number, wellness is an index. Follow the index and you'll be fine. So the idea is with Lee's technology and the work he has done, some pioneering work which has never been done before, and us being able to provide some of the small devices on the corners, as corner stores and pillars, we can now define an index, a baseline, and people can be measured against that, just like a SAT score. You are in the top 10 percentile, top 5 percentile, and you can define what their health needs to be. So I wanna, wanna talk a little bit about this word of disruption, right? So that the, the science is, so, and I'm biased, I think the science is so exciting. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the, I want to get your perspectives, if we look at the current healthcare sector, right, how do you see this influencing that sector? What's going to happen? A lot of people are asking questions. What's going to happen to the way we currently deliver medicine? What's going to happen to the insurance system? How does the government engage? They're big questions, but I thought maybe from each of you we can take little nuggets. Lee, do you want to start first? How will this disrupt and how can we manage it? Well, well let me say I've really pushed a type of medicine that's called P4, um, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And this, interestingly enough, has come about from the convergence of a global and holistic approach to disease called systems medicine, from big data, from the digitization of quantized self measurements, and I think ultimately from consumer-based uh, uh, social networks. What that means is P4 medicine is enormously disruptive and revolutionary. One, it's proactive rather than reactive. Two, it's focused entirely on individuals and not populations. Three, it has a major thrust toward wellness rather than a complete focus on disease. Four, it's about creating these dynamic data clouds that lets you measure the interactions of your genetics and your environment, which are really what your health is all about. And finally, it's taking advantage of the natural social networks that exist in families and friends to be able to use these to communicate the new, uh, new type of medicine, to actually let people crowdsource and figure out how to do things better 
And ultimately, I think these consumers, uh, patients, individuals in their networks are going to be the most powerful disruptor for persuading a very conservative healthcare system to accept P4 medicine and the revolution that's coming in wellness. So it's almost as if all the effort that's gone into P4 medicine, the natural place for it to go is earlier and earlier. So you catch the diseases early and, and power up wellness. You, you power up wellness, you catch the disease at the earliest stage, and then you leave the classic traditional system with its focus on disease with not much to do, right? Do you want to make a comment? I'll bring Ravi in a second. Do you want to make a comment about your feelings of the scale of the, of the new, and we're going to get to that in a second, but the, the scale of this, because this is going to spawn new business opportunities, new companies. Can you, you make a, a, a sense of the scale? The scale for the, the new medicine, in my view, is seven billion people, which I think is the entire population of the earth. And I think the only question is how long it takes us to get there. What is going to be critical if we're going to go to the underdeveloped nations of the world and, and democratize healthcare in a way that was inconceivable even a few years ago is the digitization of medicine, changing how we make the measurements, making them incredibly inexpensive, but streamlining everything so we can offload to Africa, to uh, wherever you'd like to do it. So the question is, how do we effectively get into the systems uh, that are in the developing world? And for example, with you here in Australia, we're exploring the really exciting idea of bringing wellness to Aborigines. And with one of your colleagues uh, in Brisbane, we're exploring the idea of bringing wellness to breast cancer patients that have gone through gruesome treatments. We'll retune them and make them whole human beings again. Let me, Ravi, let me bring you in here. Let's talk around, get your perspective, this idea of disruption. Yeah, I think that, so, and I was giving someone an example a few days ago of what, what real disruption is all about in healthcare. So today, that when you're 60 and you have a chest pain, if you were to call the hospital, and the cost is about 10,000 bucks, because they will immediately mobilize an emergency technician, an ambulance, bring you in and all that stuff. Um, but you could get a chest pain from acid reflux, which is because of some food you ate. So one of the things we looked at was what part of the healthcare system takes the most amount of dollars. And if you could figure out ways to actually make that really, really low cost and give predictive uh, interpretations, you can actually get the dollars back and deploy it towards real disease research, which requires a lot of work. So we did this test. Uh, we took our disposable device, which cost $4. Uh, we stuck it on me and uh, and the idea was, I said, I have a chest pain, so I pushed a button. Uh, instantly, the data actually goes to one of our hotspot, goes to the cloud. Uh, a remote cardiologist looks at the data and says, you ate bad Mexican food. <laughs> and uh, shut this thing down and throw it away. So you shut it down, throw it away, you go to sleep in the morning, you're normal. So you just literally saved an insurance company, a patient, a hospital, 24 hours, and close to five to $7,000. That cost from $7,000 to $5 freed up $6,000 for doing research on projects where it really needs the money. So that's one part of it. The second part of it, which I think is crucial to bring to the table, is how do you get customers to do it yourself? A patient, a patient meaning an individual, needs to be able to take these devices, attach them with the least amount of effort, in fact, no effort, make it all non-invasive, and the data is all reported in the cloud. And at that point, as Lee, Lee said, you can have enough social networks and crowdsourced people helping you basically manage the disease. I guess that's a better way to put it. So the idea is to move the cost to technology and let the patient administer themselves. Once you establish a baseline of health, how healthy you are, you'll know how to monitor yourself. And then ultimately, everything needs to go on your phone, a watch, or, or your cell phone indicating continuously on how you're doing, basically. So, Ravi, that, that, that's disruptive. Right? That's Absolutely. very disruptive. I want to just go back. I want to play with the disruptive com concept for a little while. Let's look at that cardiology example, right? So where there's disruption, that you can get technophobia, 
Thanks. Right, now that could be with the patients, but I think that could be, that's manageable with education, et cetera. But let's talk a little bit about the specialists, sure. right? I mean, how do we bring them along? Because this is disruptive for, for example, the cardiologist. All of a sudden, one could ask the question, if I have this disposal device, I may not need to go to that cardiologist. So if I, don't, if I may not need to go to that cardiologist, then maybe we don't need a certain large percentage of cardiologists that we currently have. How do we bring them along with so this journey? Yeah, it's a very good point, actually. So, so I've actually met with a few cardiologists and kind of ran this uh, scenario by them. And most of them, I would say 90% embraced the idea. And here's the reasoning behind it. Cardiologists were designed not to read ECGs. <clears throat> they were designed to perform surgery. They were designed to do things which are more complex. There is so much ECG data being collected these days they can look at it, so at five o'clock in the evening when they're ready to go home and they look at the ECG, chances are, and there's statistics out there, <clears throat> that 35% of all ECGs read at five or later in the evening are actually incorrect. And the question is, by providing these techniques, so that's why I'm not calling it a replacement for the cardiologist, I'm making their workflow very efficient. So rather than focus on the 90% normal cases, they focus on the 10% abnormal cases. So the 90% of them is fully automated. That they buy into, and everything we are doing in our technology and in, in the things, the way we are providing the information, it's all coming from published journals. So they respect that. In fact, some of the work is being done by cardiologists who are on our panel. So the idea is to build a consensus. Without consensus, things won't work. The consensus here is I'm making the life of a cardiologist simple enough that they focus on the real problems. So, so in effect, you're, you're, you're value adding the specialist. I mean, because this is true for the cardiologist, it's true for every doctor. Absolutely. And so, yes, there's disruption, but you're in effect, you're value adding. The, right. And Liam, I might just go to you here if, if we can. So in changing the system, you're move, going from advanced disease earlier and earlier to earlier disease, you had some ideas about how to perhaps change the education of uh, medical practitioners. Uh, to, to help make this transition you know, from advanced disease to wellness. Do you want to pick up on that? Sure, uh, sure. I think if you ask me, a challenge we face with P4 medicine is how do you bring that to physicians? The best way I can think to bring it to physicians is to go to medical schools, take their first year class of MDs, put them through the wellness test, let each create these data clouds, dynamic data clouds of billions of data points, and let each of them learn how to analyze it, identify the actionable possibilities, understand the whole new process. And as you're doing that in the first year, you can design a course around just what the students have done with themselves. When they go to the second year, you can design a more sophisticated course that maybe gets into technologies, that gets into the computational challenges. And when you go to the third year, you can really begin to integrate it with physiology and pathology. So you could, by taking this cohort of medical students through four years of this kind of wellness study, create a whole new curriculum in the medical school, and when they came out, they'd be incredible advocates for P4 medicine and the importance of wellness in healthcare. Wow. I think, Lee, I just want to add one more thing to what Lee just said, and we've actually done this, so we are going to offer uh, the predictive interpretation we have algorithm as a part of the medical school in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And the thought process is you train people to start looking at what is an efficient workflow rather than the strips of paper you look at once in a while. The idea is strip of paper is still there, store it in the back room. Okay. What you see in the screen is interpreted. This is the result. If you say yes, sign off and you're done. Yep. So it's the same concept what Lee is saying. So P4 and what we are doing combined together trains the next generation of doctors for, for the right way of actually becoming more efficient, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I want to just, I want to go to this, I want to transition now from disruption, which is clear, to opportunity. So if you look at human history, times of great disruption, uh, that they're usually times of great opportunity. So I want to ask each of you to comment, maybe if, if you were to compare this, let's compare it to the internet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, the internet, major, major disruptive technologies. I mean, 
how would it, com the co computers, the internet, computers, how would this era of disruption, in terms of scale of opportunity, compare to that? Computing, the internet, um, uh, wellness. Um, and, and maybe, Ravi, if you could pick up also on some of the developing world uh, aspect, think of the scale of the industry and what would it look like? So I, I'd say one thing, P4 medicine actually has a focus on wellness as well as dealing with disease. My argument is that there will be a whole new industry that emerges called scientific wellness. And my prediction is in 10 to 15 years, the market cap of that industry will far exceed the market cap of the disease industry, the current healthcare Would you care to industry. guess a number, Lee? Would you care <laughs> to what extent? I'll, I'll pass five, on that because times, the, the, the number is a function of how thoroughly you've infected the six or seven billion people in the US. But, but it is going to be enormously big. So now we have the opportunity to create the companies that are going to be the Googles of wellness so you're in saying, the future. This is going to be bigger than Big Pharma. The, 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 this, this is an industry. Big Pharma is going to be a small part of this whole yeah. picture. So this is a huge. Th th this is look. It's it will be one of the major aspects of human endeavor for the future, because wellness is the key to our success, to optimizing our human potential, and to figuring out the early disease transition. So we're going to put enormous resources into wellness compared to what we do now, almost nothing. And Ravi, would you care to comment on the types of companies that you'd see emerging from this, this new well, I think there's gonna be a whole new set of cloud-based companies offering predictive algorithms for a lot of the disease p panels we have these days, so that's one. But I, I'm, I'm also more excited about some of the other interesting things which are going on. So if you imagine that today, $1 trillion is spent on healthcare in US. It's actually being spent on people who are ill. People who are healthy, no one is spending any money of them. They're spending their own money. So if you could shift a part of it, less, like Lee said, towards the wellness, to the early health of these people, who are like the pioneers, or we call them explorers, you actually shift the burden of the healthcare cost. Dramatically, you change the landscape. Because what you would have done is spend up $1, to keep someone well and freed up $99 to fight the disease. And today it's the reverse. Today you actually capture the disease when you have to spend $99, you have no choice. So if you can do it early on. So that's why I think the concept of P4 is very unique in that sense. It allows you to capture the wellness continuum at a much, much earlier site. And I would argue, Lee, that you should actually start looking, the day you conceived is when you start wellness. <laughs> I, I would agree with that 100%. In fact... You should do it on pregnant women, actually, you before should, you conceive. Well, in, you should even go one step further. What you should do is optimize the health of the mother absolutely. before she conceives, and then you take the fetus through an absolutely an optimal environment this for brings development. Up a, this is an excellent point. So, uh, you know, in the U.S., you see these mothers who are drugged. They're on drugs, and then they have the babies who are completely, you know, in really sad shape. So we are willing to actually carry those babies forward because of ethical reasons. But why is it that no one is going and saying, we'll take the mother and fix, and her, fix her before she gets it? Yeah. It's a, it's a no. different way, it's a different dynamic because now you have a productive human being being, being born rather than someone who's gonna burden the society for a long time. Yeah. Okay, so I've asked you the easy questions. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I wanna wrap it up with a final question. It's a two-punch question, right? So we're gonna have wellness. It's gonna cost nothing. Everyone's gonna use it. It's gonna be on the, the watch, it'll monitor everything. We'll avoid all the major diseases and we'll live a lot longer than we do now. We'll save the health sector lots of money. Um, so one could ask, a lot of people ask the question, you know, how long can a human being live? And the next one is how long should a human being live? Who'd like to go first? I'll, I'll get Do started. Do Dr. Hood. So <laughs> with wellness, I am convinced that most of us should be able to live out close to 100 mentally capable, physically 
productive. And in fact, one of the really interesting questions I get asked all the time, well, if you keep them well out there, don't you still have to worry about the fact that you die over two or three years and you spend half your health care dollars in that last? Uh, and what has really been interesting in our studies of people that are 100 or older is when they die, they die extremely quickly because they have a complete systems crash. So the objective I have for wellness is to get you out to 100 and then you're on your own and you're not going to cost society much when you die, right? But you'll be effective, you'll be productive, you'll catalyze all sorts of sociologic changes because society is going to have to reproduce. Uh, restructure how it does things because you're going to have an enormous effective population and you don't want to use the talent, the wisdom, the creativity of people in their 90s just because they're 90. So I think this is going to be utterly transformational and we're going to have to go back and restructure how we think about retirement. We're going to have to go back and restructure. How do we bring jobs to the young. How can we keep all of these people fully occupied? Because on the other hand, we have the robots that are taking away, as, as Robin yeah. has suggested, <laughs> all of this routine Oh no, I know, we, we'll get them work. to create new wellness industries. Though. Yeah, <laughs> new wellness industries. <laughs> so anyway, my, my feeling is we can take you out to 100 or so. Now, what's the maximum you can live out beyond that? You, you know, I'm, I'm really skeptical about pushing it a lot further, just in the sense we don't know how to deal with these com complete systems crashes and failures. And maybe yet, in, yet, in 100 yet. years, mm. we'll be able to do that and then really extend things. But, but look, we know we can take humans out to 100, and under optimal conditions, they can perform superbly. So we'll be able to do that with many, many people. How long should a human live? I think a human should live as long as they're creative and productive and enjoying life. Ravi? Um, so actually, I'll start with the second one. How long should a human live? I could completely agree with Lee, which is if you're productive and well, you should live. As simple as that. Uh, and I think to Lee's point about the system crash, I believe that it's more damaging to the healthcare industry when one of your body parts fail versus when the whole system crashes. And, and you can see this in technology happening today on your cell phone. You're willing to replace it when the whole thing dies versus when the battery fails. So, so you have to keep that perspective. So I always, you know, when people ask me this question, my mom is 82, my grandmother died when she was 90, but they were very, very productive and they just had a completely natural system end system shut down and died in their sleep very calmly. No, So that's really the, the key question is, can you take a human being and regardless of how long they live, are they living to a point where the system crashes but the body part doesn't fail? And keep them productive. And productive, obviously, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so, so if your body parts are all working, the assumption is the brain is working, which means you remain productive, you can think for yourself. Because a big part of wellness continuum starts from you know emotions all the way to physical and, and you have to capture all the elements to say that I can you, know, you can be well and not be able to communicate with your kids and and that's emotionally damaging to someone else now so you have to capture all these moments uh, and all these ideas but at the end of the day I believe people will live for as long as their system doesn't crash and I would rather have a system crash than a body part fit and, and the other point that I'd make that is really important is I think we're going to be able to develop metrics that will allow us to determine your physiologic as opposed to chronologic age. Mm. And if each of us have that measurement sitting there facing us, there's no more powerful incentive for acting on your actionable possibilities, improving your diet, improving your exercise, all the things that go together uh, to make you well. Because if you're 77 and your physiologic metric says you're 50, you're in terrific shape. If the inverse is true, you better get working on it. 
<laughs> so I think uh, what I found out, you know, I mean, as a part of doing our business, we've also talked to insurance companies. They actually love the idea because their point is they are, as we are paying them premiums to keep us healthy, they also recognize that we are the biggest users of that money and only few of us get it actually. Yeah, I would think that would be the biggest ally. Absolutely. So, so, so I broke... They may not know it, but they yeah. are the biggest ally. Absolutely. So if you look at the... the I mean, our U, U.S. is an example. And uh, true for all countries, but U.S. is very specific. You've got the pharmace pharmaceuticals, you got the payer, you got the practitioner and the patient. And the patient is buried under the stress of these three guys sitting on the top trying to squeeze money in the system, right? But if you make the patient well, you disrupt the whole economics, actually. Because if you apply P4 medicine to, for example, me, who was you know, predisposed to diabetes, there's chances I'll, I'll never need glucophage. So I'm going to disrupt the system, except the insurance company is happy because they have a lot more money to spend on people who have real problems. So, so we found out through our analysis that the first people to embrace this are the payers, which is insurance companies. Which is shocking, actually. In most cases, they're not, right? <laughs> it, they're not at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they usually block. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the second one we found out, which is very interesting, was the patients. Because <laughs> they said, if I'm healthy and I have to be productive, I don't want to be paying for a high for insurance. So there are models we have put in place. And in fact, there's a company in South Africa right now they encourage you to exercise, and if you prove to them that you have exercised enough, they give you a discount on the insurance. Yep. Simple. It's, it's like, like smoking. smoking. That's right. Yeah. So it's same. So I think, yeah. to your point, that's how I think it's going to transform. Now, money, like anything else, cannot be created or destroyed, so it just shuffles back and forth. And the question becomes, where does it end up? So my belief is, all the money which is spent in the wrong care will end up in wellness, and by keeping people well and healthy, they will be supplementing the insurance business <laughs> for a long time. Just before we leave, what, what about this idea, this landline versus mobile phone business? Mm -hmm. I want to bring your experience, what yeah. you're doing yeah. in the developing world right now, which is fascinating. So you know, there's this argument of, you know, the West world, it's just so complicated, regulations, et cetera. Uh, the developing world, they might, might just skip it, yep. you know, straight to the mobile phone type technology rather mm -hmm. than the landline. I'm using the analogy sure, very sure. loosely, right? Mm. Do you want to just comment on that? That, that yeah. could be a way to, absolutely. to really accelerate uptake. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, I believe... Go there first. Go absolutely. to the developing world first. In fact, I believe if you price it right and the developing world can support it, that'll be the first people to embrace it. No question. Because the reason they have not embraced healthcare and healthcare ideas from the Western society is because they can't afford it. It's as simple as that. So if you can help afford that. And that might then catalyze change. Absolutely, no question about so, it. So let me, right along those lines, my, my favorite analogy is, suppose you're, it's 1990, and you ask the question, can you ever imagine that a woman in a rural village in India could make a living with a cell phone for her family? And the answer would be no, that's utterly impossible. Yet it's happening today Absolutely. because of the digitalization of communications. The digitalization of medicine will provide exactly the same opportunity. So the poor in rural villages in India will be among possibly the Absolutely. first to experience these in kind fact, of benefits. Gonna, what an incredibly yeah. no, and, and, exciting kind of idea. In, in fact, I mean, I don't know if Lee, if you want to share, but we are, Lee and I were working together, and along with Matt, your, your single cell genomic stuff, is to figure out how do we actually start a trial in India to get this going quickly so we can actually offer great services to people who have never seen healthcare, yeah. right? And to me, that's transformative, more not just from the dollar standpoint, but society in general, because you've now impacted more people with a very, very low cost engine. And I'll just emphasize one of the things that really irritates me when people are skeptical of wellness is they say, oh, that's only for the upper socioeconomic group. <laughs> Every human is going to benefit from wellness. Every human can understand the enormous benefits so we have to go prove that. Absolutely, and that's what we'll do.